I'm really excited today to have Dr. Issa Blumi with us. He's a docent or associate professor of Turkish and Middle Eastern Studies at Stockholm University and the Institute for Turkish Studies within the Department of Asian, Middle East and Turkish Studies. Um, he holds a PhD in history and Middle Eastern or Islamic studies from NYU and a master of political science and historical studies for, from the New School for Social Research in New York. Um, so today he's speaking on, wait, I, I don't have your title in front of me again. So maybe you can, <laughs> hang on, whoops. I'm gonna look at it again, sorry. <clears throat> Uh, he is speaking on an Ottoman story until the end, reading Fan Moly's Post-Mediterranean Struggle in America, 1906 to 1912. Take it away, Isa. Okay, you can see my, uh, my uh, slideshow at the moment, correct? Uh, uh, no, no. We, we're not seeing it. You're not seeing uh, it. You're no, not seeing uh, a title. Uh, hmm. You should okay. share screen, possibly, yeah. so. Yeah, I did that. Okay. Oh, you did? Yeah. Let me try this again then. Where are you guys? Yeah, Zoom try meeting. it again. Share screen like this. Now. Oh, there we go. Yes, okay. now we can see it. Excellent. Now if I can get to the slideshow, boom. Are we, are we, are we rolling and rocking? Yes, perfect. Yep. Perfect, okay. Uh, firstly, I just want to, out of solidarity, uh, shiver a little bit in cold. And um, I still know how it feels to be in an un- an unwelcomed uh, uh, Arctic blast. Sorry to hear you guys are suffering out there in Texas. Uh, tears, of s s sincere tears are dripping down my face when I read your stories. But in all, uh, I, I'm, that's of course, one, I'm saying this because I would in reality like to actually be there with you guys and, and, and present you this work personally. And, and hopefully one day will be a chance for us to all uh, get around together and go to Mary's uh, backyard and have a nice after um, presentation, coffee with milk. Um, but I'm going to tell us and share a story with a uh, quite interesting character whom I, I, I want to preface by saying that I have actually nothing um, um, but positive um, vibes to um, uh, distribute about him. But I want to take uh, the approach of actually telling his story in a way that may be counterintuitive, uh, considering that he is always lauded as one of those great uh, figures of this transitional era, and is, uh, especially in the Albanian historiography, someone who's um, beyond dispute, a hero of the state, of the nation, rather. Uh, now I'm going to challenge somewhat that um, these the underlying assumptions that comes with these kinds of narratives um, in order to, by way of bringing global bi biography into the stories of transition of the late Ottoman, late Habsburg empires, what we can actually find and discover about what actually makes these people and not the others around them or those who we don't even know anything about uh, so significant in the subsequent years. Because what I will suggest um, in this uh, presentation is that in fact, for the most part, and for the most, the largest portion of the time that we're actually covering this, this period from 1900 to 1920, say, um, he is actually not a very exceptional person at all. Um, and so the quite open question that I've been trying to explore over the course of my uh, now quite long career um, um, is, not necessarily who are the heroes of the nation, but actually the framing of what actually constitutes the nation and, and how it's positioned to be ideally one that juxtaposes itself from um, the failed project of these um, economically administered, we can debate, Keith Brown would certainly have things to say about that, um, but at least um, multi-ethnic, um, um, uh, polyglot societies that uh, included uh, men like Fanoli to being very much a, an important uh, reflection of this diversity of possibilities, if you will. And the, the, uh, this, the, the constant effort to disqualify as historically dooms this project of the late Ottoman Empire and its patriotic efforts and the, the, the coups of 1908, the attempts to reinsert a constitutional monarchy, uh, as if, again, there's an inevitability of its ending, um, seems to be quite problematic. And it, and it dictates to many, in many ways how we actually um, 
subsequently read the stories of these people who survive this process and rise to the occasion. Uh, and so, and I'm, I'm, I'm again suggesting that there are, are, are actually quite a few contemporaries who are, who are not pursuing this disaggregation of uh, um, complicated societies. There are in fact universalist projects that's very much involved um, and successful in, some, in, in many ways, resonating and, and, and protecting and, and projecting uh, and preserving societies that are otherwise uh, would be torn apart by the kinds of wars we saw unfortunately in the Balkans. Uh, from uh, Jose Rizal's anarchist alliances that spread to the globe and Lenin's Bolshevism, of course, which also had that kind of economical um, ethos in, embedded in, in the, the message, as well as even Masonic lodges, which played an important um, role um, throughout the 19th century uh, Mediterranean world. Um, so there, there's, there's, I think there's a lot to be said about not surrendering to the logic of uh, nas Balkan nationalist historiography and, and think differently about how we can um, follow the trajectory of people like Van Noli. Um, and um, in the meantime, I discover that in fact, he's while very much a celebrated figure, um, yes, in, and in there are, we can very easily list off a checklist of the accomplishments of a man who is a diplomat at some point. Um, he's certainly a man of the arts. He's a well-lauded uh, uh, poet. Uh, he's also the founder of the Albanian Orthodox Church, the first patriarch of when he actually was indeed embraced as a member of the larger uh, family of Orthodox churches, national Orthodox churches. And, and he's some one of the few uh, uh, figures who actually survived the Enver Hoxha era, where there was this periodic cleansing of the national historiography uh, in the post-World War II period. And that being said, um, without uh, making too much of this contrarian approach, uh, I do want to highlight that there are so many things that do contribute to the persona of such figures that are often um, um, left to the side uh, when the emphasis in particular is that they're national heroes. Uh, and one of the more important uh, dynamics that will continuously play out in his life is the fact that he's actually coming, or at least his parents come from a very particular region of the West Balkans, an area that now borders, straddles um, uh, Northern Macedonia, uh, northwestern Greece and southwestern Albania, um, basically an area that extends from the, the major town of Korcha um, outwards. Significant number of people who will be very much involved in, and central to actually realizing Van Noli's um, not self-evident potential of becoming the person he became are all hail from this one area. And, um, and this is an important um, important thing to understand and appreciate the networks that are established that allow for such personalities to arise. Um, they are in fact not um, uh, comprehensive. They are in fact very much concentrated in very small clusters of, uh, of communities that are self-identifiably distinctive of larger Albania, larger Balkans, large Ottoman Empire, and the kind of networks they're going to pursue and, and actually establish providing the platform for a Fanoli to actually emerge beyond his quite normal um, um, and unexceptional um, um, early uh, um, early life um, and is very much predicated on the fact they come from a common area. So these scattered roles that many of these people around Fanoli and Fanoli himself are uh, in confusing times, I think needs to be registered better in how we write history. It's often, again, we're with the already the predetermined agenda to make the story of this man coherent and make it actually one that uh, complements the, the position that he has in the historiography, loses out, I think, a lot of the complexities in the larger context in which such a man emerges, as well as the 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 diverse ways in which such a person actually lives and experiences these confusing times. Um, and I would suggest that by dislocating, dislocating Noli uh, from this, again, re retrospective particularity, setting him amid a various sets of documented calculations and actions of men, many of whom are actually from this courtship area, but in various geographic, social, economic, ideological, and cultural contexts, opens up an entire new array of possible uh, ways of understanding um, not only Noli the man, uh, 
in, in his subsequent career, but also the, uh, the, the very different worlds in which he's intermingling in over the course of this 20 year period. So doing so again highlights how celebrated the celebrated idol of post Ottoman Albania actually proves to be much less principled man, not a man really on the agenda or on the um, trajectory of becoming a national uh, um, nation builder, and and therefore very much a conflicted figure and also not very heroic at all. He's first of all young in this period. He's also quite poor. And I would suggest uh, in, in on most occasions, he's not very interesting. He doesn't actually leave a footprint and over the course of his trajectory of eventually leading him to the position where he can actually start to play a significant role in a, a very dynamic world that is uh, rapidly transforming. And there are lots of people interacting in this process that have lots, much, much more to contribute to the story than a young Fanoli. Um, he's, uh, there are, um uh very in, uh is there a way to, to bring take down these images of I'm sorry uh, of because i can't actually read the the content can i hide the thumbnail video yes okay there we go um although i do like to see the response from at least a couple of people's faces maybe i'm boring you already but i, I will read uh, with the hope that this is continuously to be coherent and also interesting um, so um, there are, there are dis distinctive and incongruent factors that are shaping Noli's trajectories at this time. Um, first and foremost, he's living in the context of Eastern Thrace, which is not very accommodating to a young man. Uh, the fact that he's an Albanian Orthodox Christian certainly contributes, but it's not the only thing. People are leaving uh, across the board, whether they be Bulgarian, whether they be Muslim, whether they be Orthodox Christian Albanian, and seeking better fortunes elsewhere. This is just the sign of the times. This is a reflection of, again, um, many people's um, uh, trajectories. And again, he's not exceptional in this regard. He's not on a mission as, as far as um, I'm concerned at this stage. He's simply trying to find a meaningful work while avoiding some of the harassments that come with being uh, relatively poor in this part of the Balkans. Um, and so uh, these are uh, indeed many occasions where Fanoli in his young uh, adult life is actually a set of cases of frustrated futures. Uh, he clearly had ambitions to do other things in his life that never came, um, came to uh, play out, to pan out the way he was expecting apparently. Uh, his um, investment in actually traveling to various locales, whether it be Sofia first and Athens to find some work, were all very modest um, gestures of just trying to find a way to make a living. Uh, ultimately, his recruitment or his way of finding his way to Egypt is uh, an entirely different set of conditions that lead to that. And then finally, his ultimate uh, trip across the Atlantic to the United States is uh, really already speaking of, of a very different kind of man with a very different kind of set of uh, future, potential futures at play before him. But what's actually happening in, this, in the course of this period from 1900 to around 1906, when he's finally sent off uh, on a mission more or less uh, to the United States, uh, there, um, this, this is a man who's um, uh, not really involved in, in the politics of of the larger universe is a man who's compelled by poverty and uh, perhaps personal ambition to um, to uh, let me be crude get laid he, he's now hanging around areas uh, in, in contexts where he's um, uh, in a very intense social environment he's joining the Athens theater you know as this is, is a uh, as a, a side hand in the back of the stage. He wants to be part of this, what he thinks, interesting group. So here's a map that kind of gives us a just general idea of this um, uh, this trajectory from his parents who, who are in the far uh, um, Western part of the Balkans, settling in Thrace because of various uh, reasons. Um, their son eventually escapes the, the backward uh, town in which uh, his family had settled to eventually Athens, where he actually falls in love with uh, the fine arts, the theater world. And he joins a bunch of vagabonds, basically, who are going to now take advantage of the, the, the booming economy and especially the demand for this kind of skill set in Egypt to um, um, 
try out the waters um, and see where that takes them. But again, it's not in, in any way something that um, animated by a sense of national uh, importance or, or the project itself of seeing the end of the Ottoman Empire by no means uh, is at issue here. And, and so um, the, the, the racinated state, which he is clearly feeling when growing up in this um, and basically maturing in the context of again, poverty, of, of the lack of clarity of where he's going, uh, is, is, is not informing um, an emerging uh, political ethos. Certainly, there's no ideological foundations to where he's going in this, at this initial stage. He's, again, uh, desperately trying to find a community in which he can um, live with. Um, uh, most of them are Greek speakers, uh, whether they're ethno ethnically Greek is another thing. It's hard to tell. Is it, does it really matter? It doesn't matter to Noli, obviously. Um, in the meantime, he is using some of the skills that he brings with him, being a relatively well-educated young boy in uh, Eastern Thrace. He has his Ottoman, he has his Arabic, Bulgarian, Greek, and Albanian, and these are um, giving him some skills to actually um, put bread on the table, so to speak, while he continues to explore this very attractive life in the theater. And again, like I mentioned before, he goes off and takes the chance of actually uh, joining a group uh, to uh, Egypt, which um, is an entirely different kind of world. Uh, it's a booming economy in many ways. It's under occupation by the British at this stage, uh, but nevertheless, it is still um, uh, feeling the impact of this, this whole 19th century of uh, massive investment in infrastructure, huge influx of migration from, uh, of migrants from the Balkans, for sure, especially Albanians, uh, and especially those from this Korcha area do quite well. They become some major landowners, um, owning ma massive cotton plantations, and then um, diversify into other cash crops that are highly in, in high demand. Uh, all over Europe. Uh, and some of these figures become quite important to the next phase of Noli's life, which is, again is just simply at this stage uh, eager to um, participate in what he finds to be an attractive part of, of being a young man in this kind of creative fine art scenes, which uh, is in the process of booming in Egypt. And it just so happens the ones who are the major patrons of the theater scene happen to be coming from his uh, parents' home region of Korcha. Um, by the time this uh, Noli is arriving with other poor migrants to find job in these booming um, Delta, Egyptian Delta um, uh, economies, uh, there's already a, an emerging, um, I would say, Southern Tosk Albanian Ottoman um, uh, cultural um, community emerging uh, with uh, the investment in newspapers, uh, the investment in uh, kind of cultural clubs that in the literature, uh, unfortunately, has often um, tailored, tailored to writing the nationalist trajectory. Uh, these are all the kind of precursors to uh, ethno-nationalist uh, identity politics, uh, formation of an Al Albanian identity um, par excellence, where in fact, if you actually look at the content of these newspapers and actually consult and consider just who's involved in these projects, uh, one, these guys are again, uh, very much uh, related by the fact that they come from a very uh, small, geographically small area of the Balkans. And um, much of the content that they're producing are, while somewhat, um, uh, there's some political bent to it, it's mostly for entertainment. They're there to cater to a demand for entertainment in um, a, among a community that's quite large, and um, and they, they want um, they want to read something, and uh, th their readership is quite large. And in fact, this community is beginning to um, gain the attention of some of the diplomatic community in Cairo and Alexandria, and this opens up certain uh, channels of communication, especially with the Habsburg Empire's representatives. Uh, a Croat named Velic is very, very keen on, uh, on cultivating a good relationship with uh, these uh, Orthodox Albanian, um, uh, let's say, uh, community leaders and uh, the Italians. So the Italians are also spending quite a considerable amount of time uh, cultivating this, this com particular community. 
as well as the Khedive. The uh, Khedive Abbas uh, is uh, the somewhat so uh, sovereign uh, under uh, British oversight, uh, is also keen on mobilizing these guys because they're quite effective and more importantly, they're very rich. It's a very wealthy group of, of, of activists. And one of the more interesting figures, Thanos uh, Tashko, um, uh, is going to be the most important figure in um, Fan Noli's life. Um, he also, again, comes from this Korcha region, and he's a towering figure in um, and not only uh, Albanian uh, cultural um, uh, themes, but he's, in fact, uh, one of the more important figures in all of Egyptian cultural and political life. Uh, a major plantation owner, he's using his resources to actually build infrastructure, including the man who builds the first modern opera in, in Egypt, as well as um, uh, publishing quite a few newspapers that proved to be quite influential in shaping uh, um, a certain kind of uh, cultural sensibility amongst its readers. And again, it's not necessarily political. And this is important. Um, for Fanoli, the fact that there is a combination of factors that are contributing to um, his gravitation towards these people, um, primarily because first and foremost, they're the patrons of the arts and he wants to be involved in uh, a variety of activities that uh, would require his skill set. Um, he's again, simply willing, wishing to be an artist at this time or an actor involved in these um, uh, in these um, in this infrastructure built by figures like Tashko, who at the same time is very much invested in um, in the homeland and wants to see the Ottoman Empire actually be um, uh, reformed to the extent that it can actually thwart these uh, encroachments of neighboring states. So this is something that, at least until 1910, 1911, these guys are heavily invested in the Ottoman Empire uh, surviving um, this era of transition. And, uh, and so uh, th this leads us to asking why are these guys heavily invested in newspapers and the theater? And again, the danger is to just simply reduce them to being um, uh, proto-nationalists who are pushing an agenda to, to f formulate uh, and shape um, the Albanian language. And, and they're playing around with TypeScript on, for these newspapers. And again, the convenient uh, interpretation um, is that these people are um, seeking to create a, a coherent uh, collective um, uh, um, that uh, will have um, and, and have a stake at this uh, process that it's, it's impossible to imagine at this stage. 1905, 1906, is, there's no way to uh, imagine what would come uh, with the uh, Balkan Wars of 1912, for instance. Um, again, and they're very much interested in catering to uh, their uh, audience, uh, which could be considered in an ethno-national frame, but it's also uh, the fact that they're um, um, offering performances in their theaters to the larger proletariats, meaning they're actually um, catering to a market as much as to a particular uh, community um, based on ethnicity or language affiliation. So um, Noli is in this um, emerging in this environment, which is very much proactive in building infrastructure that, again, I'm, I'm um, emphasizing needs not to be interpreted immediately as a, a national nation building project. Um, and over the time, some of these uh, 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 these some of these journals um, um, draw Noli in again because he has a certain skill set with languages. Uh, he's particularly uh, attractive because he has an interesting use of the uh, uh, the Tosk dialect, uh, which it comes from the fact that he has spent considerable amount of time in school, as well as uh, in in Thrace in eastern territories, which therefore develops a very distinctive kind of uh, use of, of the mother tongue, if you will. And this becomes important for um, the actual new kind of uh, trajectory of these newspapers, which again are, is largely meant to entertain. Uh, and um, there's a lot of humor involved in the, the skits that are written in, in both for the theater as well as in these newspapers. And they prove to be uh, they, they proved to be quite uh, reductive in regards to other Albanian com communities, peoples from other parts of larger Balkans who happen to be 
in the subsequent decades considered fellow countrymen. Um, and uh, Noli is quite good at um, in, in writing uh, skits regarding uh, these, these caricatures, especially of these northern so-called backward tribesmen of the north, who are mobilized in these skits uh, to be the kinds of uh, the front men, the guards, the guardians of the larger homeland in, 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 the, in a militaristic way, but they're also treated very um, negatively in terms of caricatures like their country bumpkin, that they're not really, they can't really be expected to uh, take on the intellectual burden of protecting the Ottoman Empire or the home, homeland as we move uh, further into the 20th century. And Noli is very much participating in this cult cultural elitism. And, and this is um, interesting considering uh, subsequently what role he's supposed to play in the Albanian historiography. Um, and so he's very much in a quasi proselytizing mode of, of basically lecturing uh, um, his readers uh, about the important distinction between the cultured elite uh, that he is now um, uh, mingling amongst and the larger homeland, if you will, that is largely still inept um, backward, uneducated, and uh, carries these savage proclivities that could be harnessed for political means, um, but and also for comedic reasons, as was often the case in these newspapers. The ridicule is is quite um, eye opening uh, for someone who expects to see Noli uh, a dedicated nationalist. Um, and at this time, he's also beginning to reconnect with his um, Orthodox faith, not so much as a man of God per se, but he's quite struck by the spiritual music of the Byzantine era, which he hears, as he claims, every day, uh, every weekday from a period between 1903 and 1905. And this fascination with the Orthodox, uh, the Byzantine spiritual music, uh, his closer um, um, uh, involvement in the day-to-day -day affairs of these cultural um, empires being created by Tashko and others uh, leads some of them to come to the conclusion that actually, uh, and again, we don't know quite well how he ultimately reaches this point of deciding he wants to become a priest, but there, there could be a dynamic where uh, a failed love, um, he's, he's always talking um, in subsequent years about finding a wife, so maybe he's still um, at, a, at this young age, there's certainly no woman in his life, but um, he's um, constantly flirting with this idea of, of balancing a, 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 the life in the spiritual sense and being just a normal young man, um, benefiting from uh, living in this kind of uh, life around the theater. So he gets the money uh, from these guys who quite appreciate his skills and who actually now want to push him to pursue this career as a priest and send him off to one of their other, uh, uh, um, let's say, uh, clients who is based in Buffalo of all places. And Noli ends up working in a lumber yard and he's slowly being acculturated to this very odd world in Northern uh, upstate New York along the Great Lakes. and. Um, he soon says he, he really can't take it, and um, he's then by mail ordered to go now and meet up with Sotirpeci, whom he actually met before in Egypt, and uh, he, he would be expected to work under the direct um, guidance of Peci moving forward, uh, who had already established uh, a patriotic brotherhood of Darda in uh, Boston, had established a weekly newspaper with the money that he had uh, been getting from these um, Korcha um, um, native um, 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 capitalists in, um, in the Delta region of Egypt. And uh, eventually the, the, um, the, the initial role that Noli was supposed to play under the guidance of Pechi breaks apart because they actually don't get along. And so here again is another moment in where Noli's trajectories are suddenly transformed um, and, and are, um, he has to take an, and adopt a very different approach as well as his mentors, uh, his paymasters. Um, he could have very easily just remained a subordinate to Pecci's guide, but, uh, uh, guidance, but Pecci seemed to have resented uh, uh, Maybe there, we again we have very little insights into what was the nature of this this um, this um, clash that led to them leaving uh, uh, breaking apart. Noli leaves. He ends up working um, 
printing uh, labels for cans and he's always begging uh, those guys in Egypt for some more money. And at some point he confesses he's just going to go to uh, Romania and find himself a wife there. So again, not a very ambitious man. He's, he's certainly not yet on the tracks towards um, he, um, uh, being the national hero of Albania. He finds himself uh, basically uh, marginalized by, uh, due to a uh, clash of personalities. Uh, he just so happens to find a new niche and a new, um, let's say, trajectory in life because of a scandal that breaks out um, in, um, in, in, a, um, in Massachusetts, in Hudson, Massachusetts, where uh, a friend of theirs passes away and ultimately uh, the, Orthodox, the Greek Orthodox uh, uh, priest refuses to perform burial rites because this Christach uh, uh, is um, uh, someone who um, demanded that liturgy be performed in Al the Albanian language to cater to the mostly Albanian speaking um, uh, flock of this town. Uh, and so this led to an, an initial clash between the, the, estab the church establishment and ultimately um, Noli, who was charismatic and, and, and very boisterous and led this small group of uh, protesters, uh, was caught the eye of a Russian uh, priest and was ultimately uh, and then ultimately introduced to this archbishop of the Russian church, who then ordained him as a priest. And that very quickly transformed and, and put Noli into an entirely different kind of uh, trajectory that was, again, not in any ways preordained. It was not ordained by, when he arrived that he would take this place, his place as the, ultimately the founder of the Albanian Orthodox Church, the Autocephalus uh, Orthodox Church, where St. George Cathedral is still the home of the church. And again, very far from the homeland, um, and it plays itself out in very interesting ways in a far, far corner of uh, obscure corner still for the Albanians. And even at that stage, he's proven to be uh, quite unstable mentally, as well as a, as a, as a leader. And ultimately, um, a, another character who was based in Brussels for many years, uh, Faikonica, would also from Korcha, would have to be sent by these same mentors in Egypt to make sure their investment in Fanoli uh, comes and provides some kind of results. So uh, Konica joins, uh, this is the, the journal that he uh, ran with uh, Austrian funding uh, from 1890s uh, up until 1908. Uh, he ends up in Boston in 1908 to basically um, put under his wing and guide very much like Pecci was supposed to. Um, and ultimately this leads to a group that's called Vatra. It's a failure. Uh, it, it really does not have any uh, function um, in the homeland itself, even though some of the characters uh, as depicted in these pictures, the one on the right is when they end up in Trieste for a kind of an early, 2000, uh, early 1913. It's already been um, a period of uh, war in, in the homelands. Much of the homeland is lost. Uh, massive uh, depopulation, uh, migrations. Uh, so this is really not much of an um, uh, effort other than symbolically showing up and, um, and showing what um, uh, was put together in Boston through this organization that uh, Konica and, and Noli created. Um, and you can see that Noli has the uh, tendency to be a bit performative. Um, he dons the uh, archbishop's uh, clothing there on the picture to the left when he uh, walks through the port town of Duras in a, a, a very fragile, um, independent, truncated uh, state uh, that would be recognized by some countries as Albania. Um, this is not the area in which he has much influence, knows basically no one, but nevertheless, he plays the role of a, a, uh, an archbishop of a church that is still not yet recognized as a national church. And his performative side, after getting his, doc, his um, degrees from Harvard in fine arts, and he spent many years in exile, basically after a failed political career, you see the picture on the right, he's um, a humble uh, community leader in the diaspora in North America again. 
So this is a man whose career in many ways is determined by failures as much as anything that we could consider success. He's never going to successfully um, save the nation from its its plight in the 1920s. It, um, it is still a very divided homeland. Uh, his poetry um, gets some attention, but uh, not the kind of attention which apparently he, he wanted from his cohort. He's somebody who um, is basically a, a product of the fruits of chance and the disasters that his homeland actually experienced. Um, even his attempts at being a prime minister um, fail and uh, he's he's just by uh, chance co-opted by the Austrian state and allowed to build uh, a, a progressive um, opposition party in Vienna it, uh, after his failures as a politician in Albania become a reality and ultimately he decides to go back home. And so my, my underlying point about this story is that we, we need to approach the bio, uh, biography uh, with a little bit more less um, um, knowledge about or less willingness to tell the story to an ultimate logical conclusion of how he becomes the national hero. Uh, there are far more, too many other imprints that uh, are affecting uh, this individual's life that need to be uh, fleshed out, not as, again, side notes to a one man's trajectory to become a hero, but actual um, contexts that shape not only his life, but the many people's of lives around him. So um, this is something that I've been working on. I've published a, a shorter version or a longer version of this presentation recently. Uh, more are coming. Uh, and this is just my uh, new way of, of challenging how we write history about the Balkans and how we can approach it by deconstructing a little bit and pulling back the veneer of the hero in the nationalist historiography that all of our uh, areas that we focus on, whether it be Bulgaria, Greece, Albania, or Romania, whatever, uh, we all we all familiar with this kind of character. And I suggest that we, there could be uh, new ways of revisiting these characters and, and flushing out more complicated stories of the societies around them, the, the institutions around them, and and more importantly, the one the institutions and the and the and the uh, people who actually never leave an imprint on our historiography. And I think that it would be a wonderful uh, excavating uh, uh, project to actually find those who actually do not resonate in their heroic stories, but are very much part of how they actually became heroes in the first place. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Dr. Bloomy. Um, fascinating. Yeah. Do you want to stop share? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Thank you so much for that rich story. I was riveted. I mean, that just following the twists and turns of his life, I had no idea. And it really kind of takes you through that period of history and, and makes you think about it in a, a different way, in many ways. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so, um, yeah. so we're gonna take questions from the audience or if others don't have them, I can start with a question. Um, I was, I was loving at the end how you were talking about his sort of performative moment with his, you know, wearing the clothes and getting off the boat in Albania and linking that to this, um, his background as a performance artist, I think was really interesting. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, you know, we have examples in American history of people who've gone from acting to the presidency. <laughs> so we know there's something about the hubris of that or the needing of a stage, you know, that maybe lends itself to going into potentially politics or wanting that kind of attention. But it's interesting, I've always thought uh, through the sort of, you know, the so-called nationalist figures of the 19th century and early 20th century um, as people who weren't necessarily nationalists to start out with and maybe even to end up with, but interesting how many of them thread through the arts in many ways. I, I don't know as, as many being involved in the theater though, maybe you could talk about that if there's more sort of theater-based nationalist figures across the region, certainly poets. Um, a lot of poets and writers and people like this have, have became kind of involved in, in nationalist movements across the region. And so it, 
I guess what really captured me about this story was, and I've always thought of, you know, how do revolutions happen and how do we get the sort of tumultuous revolutionary <clears throat> kind of flow in Balkan history in the 19th and 20th centuries. And um, it's hard not to connect it to kind of the youth and sort of aspirations or frustrations of younger men and their sort of hubris and hope. Um, and the, but that's a really volatile thing. So it's not necessarily nationalist. It can take on many other forms, as you mentioned, socialists, you know, anarchists, other kinds of revolutionary kind of forms. So I, I don't know, do you, can you just maybe relate his story to sort of others across the region in that same time period or maybe earlier? Uh, probably not, not in the, the in regards to theater, no. Uh, I mean, and I think people e evolve in certain different kinds of settings, right? I think people are very flexible and uh, as human beings, we all are, I hope. Uh, maybe we're increasingly not so, but certainly at, at, at this period where, uh, um, you know, you're a young man and you're trying to find just a way to eat. So, okay, you, I'll do some damn translations, but man, I really like this theater stuff. And, and, and he clearly was not a good actor or he was not someone who was able to uh, get on the front of the stage, but he was always this backstage guy. He was always around. He was kind of the guy who... All right, nice, nice to see you, Fun. You know, hang in there, and maybe we can give you a little role where you can put on a wig or something in the in the back. And and, and he hung around, and there were this this right combination of elements. He was actually uh, quite talented with the pen. Um, he did, again was able to write these things that they catered to an audience at a particular point in time in Egypt. Uh, which again, very, very dislocated from his uh, his homeland uh, in some ways, but very much part of his homeland as well. His homeland was basically uh, um, moved to the Delta region of, of Egypt. Uh, and uh, how his frustrations, I, I think, come out, again, they're not really reflected in his own memoirs. Uh, he does share letters in some of his memoirs about his communications, especially with Tashko. He, the, some of these letters do complain about how dirty America is and how frustrated he is. He's, he, how hungry he is. His first six months, he lost 17 pounds. You know, these kinds of things that uh, reveal a man who's not very happy, not very successful, clearly not going to make it as a, as a, a man, even though he's now going to start taking classes at Harvard and ultimately get a degree in fine arts. That too um, doesn't lead to him abandoning what seems to be his forte, which is to don on some religious garb and um, using some Albanian translations of liturgy, um, perform most likely. It must have been a very um, picturesque kind of setting for him to do something that he couldn't do in the theater. It was actually perform a role. And you'll note in the pictures that I showed that uh, once he did end up going back to Europe uh, in these failed missions, uh, he wasn't wearing his religious garb. He was, a, again, a, a man who liked to present himself as a, uh, someone to be taken seriously. He was properly dressed, um, still stood out quite distinctly from the others around him. Um, with, with the, his choice in his beard, the way he cut his, his facial hair, it, it, it's an interesting way to look at a, a character. I'm not a psychoanalyst, I, and but I, I know these types of people in my own life. Uh, but I couldn't tell you for a fact who are similar kinds of characters across the Balkans. Um, it's only now we're beginning to learn a little bit not more about theater in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, a former student of mine's wife in UCLA, she's uh, doing early... Um, uh, late Ottoman and early post-Ottoman uh, uh, theater in, Mas in Skopje, in, in northern uh, Macedonia. And so she may have some insights in this regard, but I haven't shared this work with her. So uh, I'm hoping that slowly we'll get more and more people into looking at what was going on in um, Ottoman period Balkan theater. It's there for sure. Some of these big towns like Salonika certainly have a lot of things going on. These are, these are swanky towns. There's a lot of things uh, happening, uh, even in places like Duras or uh, certainly uh, these new, new independent capitals like Athens are, are seeing the influx of people. 
let alone um, the Delta of Egypt, which is again, attracting huge numbers of migrants from the Balkans. Many of them are coming to get jobs precisely to perform in these theaters and these music groups. And, and, and we know very well from Carol Woodall's work on uh, the immediate period after the fall of the empire, how we have these traveling groups of performers in Istanbul and Izmir and, and Egypt. Uh, so we are slowly getting our hands around the kind of culture of, uh, especially around theater at this era. Obviously poetry is easier because it's there on print and we have it in the newspapers, but what's actually going on in these uh, public um, um, environments, it's a, it's a compelling way. Uh, it's an interesting way to look at um, how political culture is experienced um, uh, through this prism. And it's not so overtly political, right? Or it's done so in a way that's funny. And Noli knew how to make fun of people. This was very, and I'm sure he pissed off this Petchy, he pissed off other guys in, in, in his life because he had a, a, clearly he couldn't restrain himself. Yeah, I think Kirill <clears throat> has a question and then Vlad, go ahead, Kirill. Thank you very much, Dr. Neuberger. Uh, Dr. Bloomy, first of all, thank you very much for presenting at our seminar such an interesting story. And most importantly, um, what, what really caught my eye, especially in your slides is, first of all, I want to commend you for your, for your academic bravery and I'll tell you why. Uh, dealing with uh, romantic, uh, sort of um, uh, romanticized uh, figures, especially on the Balkans, is is an interesting business, especially heavily politicized, um, even, you know, post-socialist countries, as probably some of the participants today and certainly the more established authors would, would testify, <laughs> as you know, how things are perceived, um, you know, for, for mass consumption. Uh, for me as a political scientist, you know, just this look is, is, is brave. Um, and uh, I'm just going to cite one of your, uh, you know, sites when, when you were saying it's a product of chance. And you were talking about deconstruction and um, what I would say de-romanticizing and looking at uh, kind of a hard look of, of what really multifactorial sort of inputs were there in order to derive to, to this status. But my question is uh, possibly for, for all of us, you know, to think through, you, you said, specifically that we need to find new ways in dealing uh, with uh, those stories that need to be told. Uh, and I just wanted to ask uh, just, to, you know, just a comment on what does that mean in terms of methodology, you know, especially for, for our colleagues that are working on their dissertations and so on. So what you were saying, you know, what, what implications those new ways that you were suggesting during your talk, you know, uh, methodologically would have in the, in the field of, of historical research, but beyond that. Thank you. Okay, very good question. Uh, uh, well, first and foremost, uh, the the very act of uh, going back to these established figures and and shaking up a little bit uh, the the um, the idea that perhaps um, they were not uh, one the accomplished uh, intellects or the 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 orators or again any, challenging the the underlying assumptions about just how again, determined they were to get to this point of history where they actually become what they become. Um, the idea that there's all kinds of contingency at, involved in, in any person's trajectory. Uh, and we know this from our own lives, right? Most of us don't have a preset uh, um, path laid out before us. And the fact that, that this is a time of so much tumult that people actually do move so often um, and, and this is where I find his story is, his story is not extraordinary. It's, it's actually a very normal story, which is how I, I, I phrase it in some of the stuff that I'm writing about him now, is that there's nothing extraordinary about him in so many ways at certain moment, most of the moments of his life are not extraordinary. And he would basically fall through our crack, the cracks, if, unless we knew retrospectively why we should be looking for Fan Noli in the story. And I find that very intriguing. And the, I mean, he's nowhere in these reports, for instance, from these various councils in Egypt, who are very invested in what's going on with this Tosk, uh, Korcha, mostly Korcha um, community in these areas. They know quite well what's going on. He's in none of these reports. He does not stand out. 
And it's it's intriguing to find out why, just why the Tashko ultimately and the others decide to give him a little bit of money and get the hell out of here. Uh, you, you know, you're not you're not going anywhere anymore. Okay, you've gotten fascinated with the with the Byzantine music. Um, and that we need more people who are uh, who are uh, creative, who have a little bit of energy, who maybe could, if with a little bit of push and some guidance, can actually make something of yourselves. But you know, go to, for, of all places, Buffalo, and then we'll send you to Boston, maybe. But these are still quite small communities. But there's also um, there are other factors involved here, right? There's money to be made. This is the new and up and coming economy. Uh, in um, the larger world. These guys are big players. They're not just, again, patrons of the arts. They're also landowners. They're building factories, and they want part of that pie. And they also recognize that they need a little bit of uh, extra uh, leverage, and as especially as time moves on, um, they want to renegotiate their positions in Egypt. Um, they certainly see opportunities in partnerships with the Austrians to set up shop elsewhere in the Balkans. Um, but um, this does not limit them to thinking um, uh, grandly and moving beyond. But Noli is not part of that process. Uh, and so if we, if we as uh, PhD students um, find and get interested in individuals like this, yes, we continue to follow their stories and, and look for their imprints in, in the subsequent years, but also try to figure out what goes on around them. Because without us understanding what makes Noli possible, uh, we're not going to understand what made Noli possible. Uh, we, we, and we just certainly cannot any longer expect to uh, tell a story where he was just this extraordinary person who was destined to become uh, the person he became. And it's not the case at all. And none of these people, um, I mean, none of these people uh, prove to be um, uh, um, guarantees to being historical figures. And, uh, and I find it very interesting. There's so many of these potentials out there that if we actually start looking and finding them as Noli, as again, not, there are more people leaving imprints than Noli in these materials, for instance, that go nowhere because no one bothers to look who, who is this person because this person didn't survive history, didn't survive this transitional phase. Um, they may still be, their ancestors, their children may still be in Egypt, uh, as many of them were. So there's so many wonderful opportunities as a Balkanist, as someone who works on Eurasia to uh, get back to the micro histories, get back to these kind of mm -hmm. yes, biographies, yes, but provide an infrastructure, provide some kind of foundations, mm -hmm. context, and the multiplicity of context. Again, Noli is just jumping from place to place to place, even in the same town, but he's in different uh, different environments that don't yeah, necessarily leave. Shifting roles, you know, which is mm -hmm. mind boggling sometimes. Thank and you he's very not much. Leaving, yeah, and he's not leaving <laughs> imprints in the same places. So you have to actually look elsewhere. You just can't rely on council reports or the uh, the the records of the of the theater or you have to actually think that you know he's also patronizing other places maybe he's arrested for uh, for for drinking or something i don't know it, it would be a good thing to look for these kinds of characters getting arrested when they were not really important well thank you very much for this because basically you're telling especially you know our younger colleagues look harder you know for more sources which would resonate, I guess, with uh, with uh, sort of the advice, you know, they would hear here at UT, but all across those institutions in order to get a realer picture. Um, I think uh, uh, Dr. Baronia is um, uh, raised his head. Vlad, you're welcome to have your question. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, I... Uh, basically didn't really know anything about this figure, but uh, recently I uh, read uh, Janine Marie College's uh, History of Southeastern Europe, and she features him uh, on that sort of early 20th century period of the Ottomanization. He's one of the figures that gets highlighted. Um, but uh, it was really interesting, sort of, I have a comment and then kind of a question. So my comment is more about, um, you know, in your talk, I really liked how you brought up uh, this idea of frustrated futures or failed futures um, and how that those frustrated and failed futures both were related to sort of historical contingency. Um, 
on the one hand, and then also how they intersected basically with these uh, biographies, right? Uh, so these micro scales actually intersect with these sort of uh, macro scales. And my, uh, my comment is more about, you know, in terms of specifically for this region, which is kind of a graveyard of failed futures in many ways, um, what can we, uh, are there, um, uh, are there, uh, so can we recuperate or recover these failed futures, you know, uh, uh, is there an attempt to do that outside of, let's say, you know, Western academics who are interested in uh, sort of Western academic historiography on the Balkans. And then uh, I guess my question uh, that I'm sort of uh, 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 sort of pivoting towards too is uh, uh, in terms of this sort of transnational uh, uh, framework of Noli's biography and uh, this is maybe uh, something that uh, Chelsea is interested in as well, uh, if I'm going to be a little presumptuous here, but uh, uh, so his time uh, in the US and specifically uh, uh, at Harvard. Uh, so I'm just interested in that kind of micro history, like was how open of an institution Harvard was, how was he kind of, um, um, how was he sort of viewed in that context of, you know, elite American academia, um, you know, specifically because of these slippages between nation, ethnicity, and race? Uh, did that contribute to sort of uh, his interest in, you know, the Albanian national project, uh, ultimately? Um, so those are just a few of the questions I think that, um, your talk has raised for me. And yeah, thank you so much. It's a really great presentation. Right. Shall I answer that as well? Uh, I'll be as brief as possible. Uh, the records um, on Noli's uh, acceptance and then ultimately his degrees, it, it's available, um, but there's not much in terms of uh, reflections from uh, fellow students or administrators about why he's entering and he, he has some money. He's also already a figure in the community. Um, and this is one of these, some of these universities like to, of course, uh, gather up, gobble up talent or people of influence. And um, it's again, it's, it's not accessible to me. What was the calculations of getting this guy in? Uh, he did not, was not a regular student. It would took quite a bit of time for him to finish his, his schoolwork. Uh, but it's also a reflection of what he was doing on the side, right? Uh, by this, by that time, and there are others in that community who end up going to Harvard as well, uh, not pursuing fine arts per se. But obviously, this is an institution that gives some kind of uh, carries some kind of merit, um, and it's a place for climbers to go. Uh, uh, but uh, really, in terms of administrative records, uh, it, it, it may be there. Um, I, I haven't had a chance to look at it myself. And that could be if there could be one of those places where you want to look and gain some insight. Uh, his 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 work in general is it's it's not outstanding. Um, his commentary on Skanderbeg and others are, um, I, I guess, almost um, norm, normative type of kind of writing. And unfortunately, the his, the public historians are the, really the only ones who are doing any of this kind of work of biographies, and they're they're not really. Um, familiar with some of the pitfalls of these assumptions that we bring with uh, how we present these kinds of characters. I think there's going to need a whole generational shift. And unfortunately, in especially in, in the Albanian parts of the Balkans, there's no money to be a historian. And so much of the talent goes elsewhere, uh, unfortunately. Uh, slowly but surely, we have a couple in the diaspora, but um, they're invested more in, uh, in other projects that are also very much tied to telling a national story, which is contrary to what I've been trying to do all my career, which is saying, hold on a second, let's, let's um, maybe abandon um, this, um, this project and look at actually what's happening on the ground at the time, as opposed to assume that everyone is rushing to leave the Ottoman ship, so to speak. Um, so there's 
there, there is no better place to do that kind of research than in, in places like North America where the municipal records are still there. You know, we're not talking about wars that have wiped these places out. Unfortunately, in the Balkans themselves and many parts of the other areas of the world that I work on, uh, that kind of stuff is not available. So uh, once we can go out, we can go to the Boston Library, we can look at some of the newspapers these guys published uh, and maybe look at some, again, these municipal records, look at these court cases. Uh, there could be some interesting insights that come in because they're constantly suing either each other or other organizations to get access to property and um, the right to practice uh, their faith. So um, there's, I think, lots to do still, uh, even regarding a small community like that up in Boston. Well, actually, it was a Bulgarian that was um, at Harvard who wrote the Harvard hymn, Stoyan Vatrolsky. The Bulgarians are famously know about that. <laughs> um, so, Raul, do you want to ask your question? Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. It was really, really interesting. And I really appreciate this, your, your view on, on contingency. So my curiosity is about the contingency of him becoming a nationalist hero and his construction as a, the, the construction of the Fan Noli myth. Why him and not someone else? And in this respect, it's also, I mean, this is one of the stories that's quite familiar from, you know, looking at the Albanian um, diaspora. It's a story that unfolds mostly in the diaspora, mostly outside Albania proper. So I'm curious about the links with Albania. How how well known were these uh, characters inside the territory of what would become Albania at this time? Were these publications read? Well, was he known before Wilson and you know the Paris piece uh, within Albania proper? And who are the characters who contingently constructed the Fanoli as national hero? Myth. Good question. Uh, he was not um, the, um, he, there was a lot of challengers uh, and, and I, I wouldn't even think he was the most major, most important figure in the, in the diaspora in the United States even. Uh, and again, I think he's resurrected by the very fact that he's a failed uh, prime minister. And, and then subsequently he goes, runs around, some of the people around him are executed by Zog, who is the kind of successor claimant king. And by the very fact that he's going to be somewhat of a patron in Vienna of the first generation of communists. Uh, and um, subsequently in Enver Hoxha's period, he's very much celebrated as um, a kind of working model, if you will, for um, um, uh, mediating these cultural contradictions that exist in, in the Albanian societies along religious lines. And this is a man who ultimately was willing to set aside his religious um, orientations for the betterment of, this, of the nation. And uh, he even embraced um, a socialist uh, ethos and actually became allies with the first generation of communists. It didn't hurt that he was from Korcha. There are plenty of other figures that um, had similar kinds of portfolios and certainly stood on principle throughout areas that were largely um, eviscerated, not only demographically, but literally historically by the Enver Hoxha regime. Um, this is something that I actually looked into my, when I was way back when I was a master's student at the New School. Um, and I haven't come back to that, but uh, one of the one of the important uh, contributing factors to Noli's endurance um, is the fact that much of the work on him was actually done by Enver Hoxha's guys, and uh, the diaspora was desperate for content, even um, over the course, of, even with the exception of the Catholic Church, which spent a lot of resources to actually write their story, which was again not permissible in the Hoxha period. Uh, everyone else really in the end depended on Hodges' um, very productive um, um, history departments. They produced a lot of content, uh, of course, rewrote and constantly rewrote their own content. This, I think three, four times uh, the narrative about the origins of, this, of the uh, Communist Party, because some of them, of course, had to be eliminated. Uh, the, the breaking with the Soviet Union and the breaking with China it all uh, demanded rewriting of the, the textbooks. Um, and Noli survives. Uh, he's one of those kind of reliable characters throughout. Uh, others are, um, at various points in time, uh, suspect. 
And you can see that reflected in the historiography, in the official historiography. And again, sadly, uh, there was not much opportunity to develop skills in Kosovo. Um, and today, no one wants to be a historian other than you know writing from the uh, from the cafe, and they don't want to go through getting a PhD in history. And very few people out there um, are doing this kind of um, archaeological work needed to really get to the heart of what's going on. He he's I think legitimately a character to be uh, focused on, um, and he's certainly leaving an imprint. He did. In, he did interesting things for people, but he was not the center of attention when he showed up the first time in 1911. Was, who the hell are you? He, came, he left very frustrated and went uh, eastwards, went to Odessa and apparently had a good time at the beach. Um, he, he just was not, um, did not find the kind of, um, he did not have that mag magnetic uh, um, um, appeal uh, and Clearly, by 1912, 1913, when he came back with his uh, Konica, uh, with under the flag of Vatra, it too was really a marginal um, coalition partner in this larger et enterprise of trying to somehow save, salvage the homeland from the, its partitions. And um, he didn't last very long as a prime minister. And that was a failure. And again, he could have very easily just fallen off uh, into, the, into the night as many others did who also failed during this period. Um, but I think for a variety of reasons, Hoja's uh, peoples um, resurrected him. Okay, Chelsea's had a question for a while, so. <laughs> and, and Christian as well, yeah. Yes, Christian's yeah. next after Chelsea. Okay. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Hi, Chelsea. Hi, um, thank you, Shumpanam Dave. Um, my question, I, I have a lot of questions actually, very, a uh, lot to think about. And actually I was reflecting on my first, um, the first time that I attended the recently resurrected Society of Albanian Studies meetings um, through ACES, uh, because we had two people who'd grown up in the Boston area and were part of this um, diaspora and opened up with, you know, these kinds of conversations um, at the meeting. And so I was reminded of that as I was listening to your talk. Um, but what I was really interesting, interested in too, thinking about my own work um, with Egyptians in um, Albania right now and how Egypt it, as a place configured in your talk today, but also just the kind of critical role that Egypt played as a site and also, and I guess too, in, in, um, um, and like in another in a sense too of like a, of what I guess happened and occurred and was allowed for in Egypt. And then trying to understand that in the present day context of you know those Balkan Egyptians who don't consider themselves Roma, um, consider Egypt to be um, you know, a, their homeland and their site. Uh, and I was just wondering if you've come across how uh, Egyptians in the Balkans uh, relate to this story about Noli, um, and also too, I guess, to these kind of other questions too, historically of the role that Egypt was playing in relationship to Albania. And I say that too, because as you know, right, many people actually discredit the narrative about in, in Egyptian origin. And in fact, consider all, you know, people um, who are called Egyptian to be Roma, right? And so there's a, there's a big conflict there. And so I was just wondering if you could speak about that. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to talk much about that. I don't see any imprint in the in the records in the Ottoman period uh, for that kind of migration. There's certainly uh, classic examples of communities who come from various parts of the larger Islamic world who settle in the Adriatic coast. Um, there are people who settle in the plains of Kosovo from various parts of uh, the world through the Ottoman Empire. Uh, as a coherent community uh, who are understood to be coming from Egypt, which in itself conceptually is problematic, uh, territorially, um, what constitutes um, Egypt in the end of the 19th century was not the same before then. It's really Muhammad Ali's uh, conquest of Sudan and integrating the areas of Bugunda and so the areas of further south even to uh, the Great Lakes areas that Egypt 
um, takes on a particular kind of cartographic reality. Um, uh, e Egypt's prior, the, I'll, let's say peoples from the Balkans had migrated and settled in Egypt since millennia, right? Uh, we know this. Uh, that's not uh, the issue, I don't think, either. During the Ottoman context, uh, soldiers uh, were often based throughout North Africa who had come originally from the Balkans. You, you see many of them who went back home and built their homes. You go inside, see these amazing wall paintings in, in Tatova or Shkup or in, in, in Prizren of where these guys had spent their careers as soldiers on behalf of the Ottomans. And you see often references to... Uh, far off uh, places. In terms of the actual peoples who end up being identified as Egyptians, saying so, I just I, I can't tell you anything. Uh, yeah. Oh no, no. I think I was. I'm sorry. Let me reframe that. So mm -hmm. when I was in um, Albania in 2018, yeah, um, there was a a, a meeting at um, the university in Elbasan, um, and what was celebrating among the first um, kind of national celebrations of Albanian Egyptian days. And I was, I guess I was asking more about present day um, kind of more socio-racial national belonging around this category of being Egyptian and what it means to be Egyptian and how the, these kinds of formations might relate to this historical work that you're doing and really the, kind of the role that Egypt plays. Does that make I, more about that, less about you know, kind of um, these older migrations through. I'm not. I'm not reading what this community mm -hmm. is writing about their own um, kind of trajectories, uh, mm -hmm. who they are, and what they believe their origins are, and 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 how Egypt may play into. I'm actually not familiar with what they are producing as a community. Um, so I'm sorry, I really can't answer that. Uh, uh, it would be interesting if uh, how they actually do try to um, um, account for their associations with Egypt. Um, but I, I, this is something that I just don't have uh, the ability to answer. Sorry, Chelsea. Oh, no, it's, oh, no, that's not a, no, I would just, more, more curiosity of, about mm -hmm. it, about the work, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think it also is a good, like it, your talk really kind of helped me to think about some like future areas of conversation and thinking about um, these questions. So I appreciate that, thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's someone in Graz University, by the way, who may be, uh, she's now a, a postdoc there. She, she may be able to um, have a conversation with you about these kinds of things. I can't remember her name offhand, but I will, um, I can refer you to her. Oh, any, yes. I mean, yeah, we actually, no, we just met last week. Okay. Another story, but yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Christian. I, yeah. Yes, Christian would be next. <laughs> mm -hmm. the, uh, unmute yourself. Yes, thank you. Uh, first, of, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to thank uh, to Dr. Blume for the very interesting lecture. Uh, because I am an arch uh, archivist, I am working with uh, records, information, memories, and so on. I would like to ask, ask you, uh, are there any strong, I mean, strong evidence that Teofan uh, uh, was a member of the Masonic Lodge? Because you mentioned that the Masonic Lodge uh, uh, had a very large influence, influence over the Balkans, but are there any any evidence on that? On of that? who who was a member of the Mason? Telfan, Telfan. I don't understand. Sorry. <laughs> uh, Noli, uh, just a second. Uh, just a second, you. Yeah. Uh, funny Noli, funny Noli, Teofan. Uh, oh, it's Teofan. Okay, okay. I, I understand what you're saying. Okay. No, he was not a member. Of the, he was not a member of the Masons. No, but I was just suggesting that the Masons is one of those kinds of transnational um, um, movements or organizations that uh, clearly were um, biding for a different kind of uh, polity, not necessarily one that's aggregated along neatly defined racial mm -hmm. lines or religious lines or et cetera, like, but I, he was not uh, a member. Okay, I wasn't because, suggesting that. Because there's a very intensive discussion now in the Bulgarian society about the, uh, uh, how to say, uh, the participation of the, some of the Bulgarian uh, national heroes 
in such a Masonic coach. For example, about Georgi Rakovsky, Luben Karavelov, or Vasilevsky, and uh, some of the Bulgarian historians state that they were a member of the Masonic Watch, but uh, it's probably are not true. So uh, yeah. thank, you, thank you. Yeah, Noli was too small of a character. He was not significant. He didn't have any money. Uh, he was somebody who was, um, again, destitute most of his time before he uh, basically before world war two uh after world war one he things change a little bit but um he was not one of those kinds of people who could gain access to these communities these clubs thank you for the answer and i would like to thank you for the opportunity to present uh, in uh, this workshop it's a uh, some kind of uh, how to say covid 19 strange effect for me for me because I'm able through internet to, to attend to such a to such a workshops and to listen to your thank lecture. You. That's thank, you. A, thank, you the, thank you for me. Thank you. Thank you. This thank is you. the idea for for the circle to to have uh, all these people that actually you read as authors and you know meet them live and uh, this this format is actually helping us a bit. Although we would prefer Dr. Bloomy to be uh, here <laughs> in Austin. <laughs> Well, and I wanted to thank you, Isa, for putting your, plugging your books as you went, because they're all amazing books. And I hope everyone here can get the chance to read some of his books, because there's many. But he plugged a number of them there. He, I don't know how you have the time to write so many books, Isa. Well, but... More are coming. More are coming. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so um, I hope people get, we're going to um, go ahead and wrap it up for today but we want to thank everyone for coming we hope some of you will come back thank you maybe present in the future um, and we want to thank especially Isa and I hope everyone goes out and buys some of his books and reads them <laughs> thank you we will we will distribute actually a list for the books uh, you know and links and I would like also to thank to the newcomers today very glad to see that we have representatives you know from UK um, and I see some uh, universities on the east coast uh, which means that uh, you know those topics continue to be important and we hope to widen the circle thank you very much Dr. Bloomy thank you have a good day good luck guys stay warm all right. Bye, everyone. Bye. See you soon.